Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the next session, um, which uh, is how apprenticeships are shaping the future of education, uh, about future proofing the skills of your new employees. I'm going to hand over to Karen Hedger from AIM, who's going to, uh, with Master Deakin, I'm going to take you through this session. Hey, lovely. Thank you very much, uh, Rick. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it looks if we have 17 participants here. So nice, nice, nice group of us. Nice uh, for afternoon chat. Thank you very much for staying on until half past three now. The day's going on to, to join us. So um, this is our third time, I think, talking about apprenticeships at the uh, Games Summit, um, which we're delighted to do. We're now all becoming rather old hands at it. So let's hope that we can share some of our experience with you. Um, so future proofing the skills of your new employees, why? and how apprenticeships are shaping the future of education. Um, to date, we found that uh, the games industry has actually been quite reticent, I suppose you would say, and quite reserved about being very actively involved um, in apprenticeships. Maybe because apprenticeships are an unknown quantity, um, perhaps because the traditional talent pipeline has been so closely aligned with degrees. Um, or maybe it's because it all looks rather cumbersome when everyone's really very busy and just trying to get on with the work and, and running a business. It all seems all rather complicated and something that maybe is just one too many, many things to, to cope with. Um, however, um, apprenticeships are here to stay. I don't think there's any doubt about that now, whichever colour our government is. Um, and the standards um, that define knowledge, skills and behaviours for specific job roles are at the root of everything now in terms of qualifications, um, including the introductions of T-levels, which you probably um, have heard about, if not intimately already involved with. Um, so in turn, all of that is going to set um, in train the framework and the directions of all qualifications going forward. So uh, as you see new entrants to the industry coming to you, the sorts of qualifications they're becoming out, you will, will be um, to a large extent, um, having been influenced by apprenticeship standards. So, um, apprenticeship standards, knowledge, skills, behaviours for specific job roles. Um, what we're finding is that the lack of apprenticeship standards in games, we'll talk about the ones that are here in a moment, um, is restricting the content of those qualifications already. So it's really important time um, to be to involved with that really. Um, especially if industry as an industry uh, we really want to be at the heart of the direction of travel for how young people are learning about the industry it's really important to be part of that conversation um, and it gives a huge opportunity to you to shape the talent um, that you need whilst you're building the ongoing culture of learning and innovation that that you all want that's the, that's a great time to be involved in apprenticeships so um another reason um if you need another one, as part of the pandemic recovery program um, that you will have heard about the government's putting into place all sorts of things. They're put, actually putting in a huge amount of money to supporting the rollout of apprenticeships across all industries. And there's some extra money right now to take on an apprentice. So in addition to funding that's already available um, to cover the cost of the 10% of the job training, there's an additional £3,000 for employers to take on an apprentice between tomorrow, 1st of April, tomorrow, and the end of uh, September. It's in addition to levy funds, so you can spend it on anything you like. It's not unusual, actually. The government says you can spend this on anything you like. You can spend it on training. You can spend it on expenses. You can also spend it on the salary of an apprentice. So that it's a it's quite a good deal at the moment thing and you don't have to pay it back so if you're thinking about taking on an apprentice now is a really good time because there is that extra bit of money to to encourage that um anyway i don't want to spend all our time because we haven't got that very long um, i'm talking about why you should take on apprenticeships in theory it's really the best thing to do is to listen to um some of your colleagues in the industry and education who are actually doing it um being there working on standards and delivering them. So um, I'm joined by some lovely, lovely people. Um, Marcy Deakin, who many of you will know um, from Next Gen Skills Academy. Um, she's been supporting employers across the industry to develop apprenticeship standards um, and on the recruitment of training providers who are the, another key stakeholder. Um, and 
recruiting apprentices too. Um, we have Jake Habgood, um, who again many of you know um, from Sumo Digital, who's almost finished writing a new apprenticeship standard for a level seven games programmer. Written. <clears throat> written. It's written. <laughs> it's even done. <laughs> Always ahead of the game, Jake. Um, and we're also joined by Alistair Irons from the University of Sunderland, um, who is a training provider, um, working on the first rollout of the new digital community uh, manager standard. Um, and Sarah um, Hinchcliffe-Smith is also here with us from Ubisoft. Um, and she's working uh, directly with Alistair. They are employer uh, and uh, provider, um, and they are working on this first rollout of the digital community apprenticeship standard. Um, so I'm going to hand over in a minute to to uh, to Marcia to talk about that. But before we do, um, Jake, I wanted to ask Jake some questions about um, why are you so passionate about apprenticeships and why should people be involved and what, what's great about them? How can they do that? Um, please feel free to put questions into the chat box. Um, we'll have some questions at the end, but feel free to um, add questions to the box as we go through um, and we'll do the best to answer them. And we're now up to 28 people in our group, so that's amazing. So you have a, an audience, Jake. Um, why, sh why should they be involved? Why are you? Uh, uh, well, well, I think there's lots of reasons why uh, people should be involved. Um, I mean, for us, we first became interested in doing a level seven game programming apprenticeship so that we could create new routes into the games industry, into game programming roles. Um, I think, you know, we felt that there was, uh, you know, a pool of talent out there from perhaps, you know, maths degrees, physics degrees, computer science degrees that don't teach C++, um, where we could tap into that and perhaps, you know, reach out to uh, graduates who, didn't know that they wanted to work into the games industry when they were 18 years old, or perhaps had family influences, which told them they shouldn't uh, go and work in the games industry when they were 18 year old. And I think, you know, some of that's been discussed in previous sessions. Um, but I, I think, you know, for me, there is a, a sort of a bigger issue here around apprenticeship standards. And what we've learned through the process of engaging with it is how important they are in their own right. So even if you're not interested in employing apprentices, then there is a real gain for the industry as a whole to engage with developing apprenticeship standards. Um, so it's really interesting, for example, to hear uh, Sports Interactive, Matt Carroll in the last session was talking about how, you know, they were going to create this informal apprenticeship program for um, their, their students. Um, and it sounded very much like, you know, the, they were doing, uh, you know, the classic business thing. It's, it's something's worth doing. You just get on with it. And that's fantastic. And that's one of the things I love about the games industry. But at the same time, by not engaging with creating those standards, they are potentially um, uh, sort of losing out on the opportunity to shape other future qualifications because the government sees these standards as something which will act as a template for, you know, all future um, uh, uh, applied uh, standards in, in education. So, you know, there will be, as you said, T-levels, but I, I think, you know, there's a big move in government towards further education um, and, you know, more uh, technical education. And it is these standards that will be used to draw down upon to create those qualifications. So if we as an industry don't engage, then we are dooming ourselves to, you know, more generic standards being used in the future and not being able to find the right kind of specialized talent for our own industry. So, uh, you know, I would encourage people to engage. It, yes, it's a bureaucratic process. Yes, it takes a long time, um, but I think it's, it's time as an industry, we, we just kind of got behind it and you know, put the effort in that I think the film industry has already put there um, and created these standards. Fabulous. And um, tell us about the games programmer. Um, so yeah, the, the level seven uh, game programming apprenticeship, as I said, sort of aimed at uh, say, a, you know, a first class mathematician, physicist, computer scientist um, coming off a degree course. Um, and, you know, it's something that would take their skill set and then over a period of one or two years, depending on, you know, their existing um, sort of skills, 
um, would train them in C++ programming, in, in the sort of software engineering skills that the games industry would expect, particularly, you know, working in interdisciplinary teams and collaborating uh, on projects, working with game engines, all these kinds of things um, that are a key part of what we would value in a, in a graduate that's sort of coming from a, a games programming course, um, but as something which can be provided uh, as part of an apprenticeship, which maybe would be linked to perhaps a master's course. Um, and, uh, you know, that I think provides this other route, more, another door into the games industry for people from different backgrounds, you know, potentially more diverse backgrounds as well. I think that's the key thing, isn't it? That, and I know that a huge driver um, in the industry to diversify people coming into, into the industry. Um, so that, I think that's been a key thing for you um, all along, hasn't it? This uh, different ways other than um, the traditional degree. Definitely. I, I mean, you know, I, I worked as a lecturer on, on a games course for 10 years and I had the sort of pleasure of working with some amazingly talented students, um, now after award winning, some of them. Um, but, um, you know, I was always conscious that it was a homogenous group. It was largely white and male. And it was always concerning at open days when you would see people from outside that group turn up, look, take one look around the room and, you know, you wouldn't see them uh, again. And, and I think it's that's that sort of self exclusion from, for example, game programming courses is something which has affected the diversity. And it's something that by reaching out then to graduates at a later stage, you know, once they've had a chance to do their degree that they were interested in um, and, you know, bring them back into a games industry career route. Yeah, so it's, it's about, and I think that's the important thing about apprenticeships, it's not just for young people. Um, the other move now is that apprenticeships are for people of any age. It certainly isn't just for young people. So it quite often is a career change opportunity, um, particularly as, as in, we're in that pandemic, um, hopefully recovery situation that people are looking to, to change uh, job roles. Um, and the, the, the games industry has, has survived remarkably well in all of this, isn't it really? So um, that's been great. Um, the, other, the other thing really also um, is about the opportunity to use the apprenticeships for existing staff. Um, they don't have to be new. And at, at, at your level, I think, is that that's the, part of intention too I think yeah absolutely agree with all this yeah okay brilliant so we've got one standard out there which Jake tells us is it's there now it won't be long before it's, it's actually submitted. I think we published live six weeks before we get our feedback but it's yeah. written it's done it's submitted yeah yeah so it'll take a little while to be um out there and actually to go to go live um so that's that's part of the process about writing the standard and, and so Jake's been heavily involved in with um with colleagues and there's it's not just sumo have written this all on their own there have been a whole um raft of other um industry employers who've engaged in that in that process and developed um, knowledge skills and behaviors for a standard and, and a way of assessing so it's there um, the next thing that follows that is an, an assessment plan, um, and it's probably a really good time to hand over to Marcia to talk to you, um, or for you Marcia, to chat to Sarah and to Alistair about your experience of the next stage of that. So uh, with Digital Community Manager, it's out there now, it's live, it has apprentices on it. So what happens then once, we, once we've got a position that Jake has? And it's almost ready, but not quite. And it's almost ready. So hello, everybody. And I'm very happy to be here for, now I think it's the third year, and now going, yay, we have real live, brilliant apprentices on our standard. So we're probably a kind of year on or so from where, from where Jake has been. So just a quick recap. I'm sure everyone in this digital room knows what an apprenticeship is, but apprenticeship is essentially a job with training so it is bringing someone into your organization where 80 percent of their time they're they're working on the job they are you know va a valuable part of your team um, and 20 percent of their time you're recognizing that they need more training to bring them up to to a really good recognized um, industry standard so about three years ago, we started working on Digital Community Manager. Um, Digital Community Manager, as I'm sure you all know, is a 
is a fairly new occupation, but one that is growing in importance and some organisations just wouldn't be able to manage um, without a digital community manager anymore, especially as we have video games as a, as a service. Um, and um, throughout that time, I've worked with Sarah from Ubisoft. Ubisoft were their lead employer, and they were really keen to take advantage of, um, of the apprenticeship levy, which they were already paying, which a lot of you will already be paying. So um, we do, we have now have a case study, which is amazing. So I'm get, I've heard some of the concerns around hiring apprentices, some of the confusion around um, but the process, which I know is not particularly opaque, I know it's a government thing. But I think one of the first questions I wanted to ask you, Sarah, really, and for Ubisoft is, you we worked really hard in this apprenticeship. How did you actually go about finding the right person to take to take up the position? Well, the um, the Consumer Relationship Centre, where the uh, the apprenticeship is based, actually combines player support and community management activity. And um, there's always a pull towards the perceived glamour and status of community management. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and player support is always you know entry level. So I've actually been recruited from internal team members who want to evolve towards community management as a career path uh, and the apprenticeship has allowed us to to offer a, a structured career development pathway for them um, with industry accreditation and we've already you know several months into the program had one successful move from a player support agent into the community management team and there are definitely more in in the pipeline um, and lots of our employees as Jake mentioned lots of our employees have entered the games industry through non-traditional educational pathways and it's amazing to actually be able to offer them um, a learning and evolution um, experience that also gives them some accreditation and a yeah um, a, a level four uh, qualification that's yeah nationally recognized at the end of it so uh, yeah it's been yeah incredibly successful and we're, we're, we're definitely uh, liking what we see and with plans for more. That's amazing, and I had the I had the good fortune to come along and see your uh, apprentices presenting. That's a hard thing to say. Too many S's and P's. <laughs> apprentices presenting at Christmas some of the work that they had done, and um, one of the things I took from it was how amazing they were as a as a as a group. Who you know, because they're obviously everyone. They've come into this process when it when it's been remote as well. So how how. How do you think the apprentice, apprentices are now viewed within, within Ubisoft as a whole? It has been a very steep learning curve for us. And I think our experience um, really from last September is, is massively shifted all of the views of um, certainly senior management team on, on the value of apprenticeships. And um, yeah, so it, Initially, it was, as you mentioned, Marsha, it was considered a strategic move. We were paying a levy. It was, yeah, no one in Ubisoft was, was using the levy at all. We wanted to have a formal qualification that recognised the, the professionalism of community management as an activity in the games industry, and it didn't exist. There were no real degree programmes that support that either, and, and, and a lot of that came together to, to motivate us to, to, to commit to start the journey with with you in creating the, the standard. Plus we wanted tangible development and to, to grow and evolve our community managers and build this succession plan for future com devs um, as well. Send a very strong message to our people that we want to, them to develop and grow, but also to increase the diversity of the existing um, team. So, uh, yeah, the success of the programme has raised a huge amount of interest, not only within CRC, but also other UK entities are interested um, as well in, in this standard. Um, but I feel like we're going through an education process to say, oh, have you looked at apprenticeships? Why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? So really, the, the digital community manager apprenticeship has opened up our whole sort of um, consideration of apprenticeships as, as really the, the future um, in terms of professional development for all of our teams. We've got someone who's now signed up for a user experience um, degree level apprenticeship 
and we're also looking into signing up two guys for um, MSCs in data analytics later on this year. So yeah, everything has completely changed. We're suddenly massive raving fans of apprenticeships because we've had such a, as an organisation, a positive experience, but also the apprentices themselves. We've just seen them thrive um, since they started the programme. And yeah, we want to be able to offer that to as many people as we can. Oh, that's just absolutely brilliant because it's hitting all of those things that we wanted it to do when mm. we started. And the, one of the other things we talked about was that it's not actually just impacted the apprentices themselves either, has it? It's because you've had mentors. They've been also been mentored by other people within your organisation. Yeah, who've also had an opportunity to, to, to develop in those roles and are now so interested they're ask, actually asking Alistair if they can start coming along to some of the sessions because they're in they're intrigued and they want to to know no more Re, no really it's been a, a an extremely positive experience for everyone who's been involved so far oh that's, it's that's just so good to hear because it's yeah that's the theory into practice isn't it so yeah. that's that's brilliant and I'm not sure how much you would have got involved with this um Sarah so feel free to say oh it's not my area but I yeah. was um, what somebody was talking earlier about or oh, the, the kind of complexities of actually taking on an apprentice did you find that difficult navigating through well I guess we didn't experience the whole journey because we we did it internally but um the plan is to hire two external apprentices next fiscal um, and, and I guess we'll see how it is uh, there. I mean, certainly Sunderland University were incredibly supportive in helping us figure out and navigate the setting up the accounts and so on for, for funding and that sort of thing. But yeah, it's re it seems to be reasonably intuitive and um, yeah, not insurmountable. So, uh, but having said that, we haven't recruited externally yet. So um, yeah me about that in a couple of months time we we can come back and report on that <laughs> next year um and that's a really good point at which i can bring alistair in because alistair um Sunderland university and ubisoft and ourselves we had a really good partnership and i think part of why things work so smoothly is and, and why the apprentices are getting on so well was you had a really close relationship with Ubisoft and you, you planned the training. We didn't just kind of go, right, we need to find a training provider. We need someone to do this we, or we'll just pick them. It was a very close relationship where Ubisoft and Sunderland sat down together and went, right, what's the best way to train these apprentices? Um, how did you find that process? Because I knew this was a level four was a new apprenticeship for you, wasn't it? No, it, it's a, it was a really good point. And, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased to, you know, get Sarah's feedback and you know, we've talked regularly, but it's it's lovely to hear um, that things are going so well. And it, it goes right back to the to the early days when we we, we locked ourselves in a, a padded room in, at Haymarket and, uh, and, and just said, like, how are we going to co-create this? We've got the standard. That's great. Um, what does that mean? How are we going to translate that into something that is going to be practical and pragmatic and, and, and achievable? And, and and with you as well, um, you know, so there was a three-way uh, development and co-creation, and we all came at it with slightly different lens. And, and I think that's what worked really, really uh, well together. So Sarah and our colleagues were really focused from the, the business perspective. You were coming at it from the apprentice perspective. I was coming at it from an education provider perspective. And it, it just gelled. Uh, I think the fact that we all got on really well helped. Uh, I shudder to think what would have happened if we'd been arguing all the time, but we would, thankfully we, we, we didn't. Um, and, and, and really took a, a very complex uh, apprenticeship standard with a whole set of knowledge, skills and, and behaviours uh, to, to, to build in to a, a two year provision and a whole set of duties that were expected to, 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 be, to be mapped out. And we were, were really able to look at the, the existing jobs that the, the potential apprentices were going to, to be doing uh, but also the, the the jobs that they were aspiring to, and Sarah alluded to it earlier, and saying that, that you know about people um, moving forward in their, their careers, and it, it really has uh, already 
uh, as we go into, I mean, we're, we're effectively 24 weeks into provision because we're in the, the middle of the, the second 12 week tripartite reviews. Um, so, uh, it, so a number of things to say about that. One, it's, it's uh, you know, just amazing how quickly it's gone. And I, I can't believe that we're we're nearly halfway through the 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 the, the time for the first cohort, um, but it, the 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 depth of work that we've gone into, not just in terms of of subject development, which was was fine. You know, we did some start, so split into four blocks: one in digital sort of principles, digital community management. We're doing a communications module at the at the moment. We're going into professionalism, um. And then we're looking at uh, a, a big work-based project uh, to to tap it all off before I hand over to Karen for the the endpoint assessment. Um, and uh, you know that the it's starting off. I think the, the apprentices were quite nervous. Um, and when we do the the one-to-one -one reviews, or we do the tripartite re reviews, and um, they, they they've said that they're, they're, they're nervous, but they're, they're becoming more and more confident. Um, and they, with Sarah and, and her, her colleagues and the mentors, we've really been pushing at the confidence piece, which has been the, the, uh, the, the main thing to, to, uh, to, to take forward because they're all brilliant. The, the quality of the work they're coming up with is, is uh, astounding. Um, you know, and we're at the stage now that we've got six, seven hours on a, on a Friday and I've got a whole lot of stuff planned out to do. And after the first 10 minutes, I'm, well, that's out the window because the apprentices take me in a completely different direction because they're so interested in dragging uh, examples in from the workplace or thinking about how things are going to impact in the workplace. And it's as if they've kind of swallowed the apprenticeship manual uh, because they they really are uh, not just there you know, on a training course. It's really looking at how they've embraced the, what does this mean for the, the working environment? And it's tremendous. Um, they, and, and a group that, I mean, you, you mentioned it earlier, Mars, that they, the mentors um, have been a really uh, amazing group to, to, to work with. Uh, and it just shows the support that's coming from, from Ubisoft because it's not, a, it's not a free activity. You know, these guys are putting in uh, a, quite a, a hefty amount of, of uh, uh, time and effort to support the apprentice, uh, apprentices, which I think is, is fantastic and, and speaks volumes to the, to the commitment from, from Ubisoft. Um, but, you know, we, we're looking at what the mentors are getting out of being a mentor as part of the program. And they're looking at their, their management and leadership in a slightly different way because of the, the, the way that they're working with the, the, the apprentices. Um, and so it's, it's one of these kind of win-win uh, situations, which has, has been, been really, really exciting to, to be part of. Um, so from our, our perspective, it's been, been uh, great. And, and it's, it's actually great fun to do. Uh, and it's great fun to be in, involved with. Uh, because there's so many uh, uh, different aspects, going back to the apprentice standard, that, that are relevant and pertinent uh, and, and, and we can do deep dives into. Uh, an example uh, is that we were, we're talking about work shadowing and how that, that comes into play and how we're, we're trying, going to try and do that in teams. And I said, let, let, let's put a code of practice, a code of ethics together. And I thought that it would be at the handle. An, an hour's worth of exercise, and John is exploded. Um, and so, it, but it, but it really sort of shows the the professionalism of the the folks that are are, are in that 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 uh, cohort at the minute. And just going back to Jacob's point about about gender, it's nearly a 50 50 uh, gender split, which is also uh, I, I think really helps in the in the mix of folks. You know, it's uh, uh, it's because we have never bizarrely. Um, we've never met as a group, um, and of course, I I expect that everybody in Ubisoft knows everybody else in Ubisoft, but of course they don't, and they don't. So it's 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 been quite amazing um, getting used to doing it all on 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 teams. Um, but they, they 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 really are you know, things that I haven't set up for them, and they've gone away and set up their little support bubbles, and and they're doing peer to peer buddying and all sorts of stuff, which is just just great. Well, Ketra has a question, has a question um, in the chat box saying, not being an academic body, do you ever seek education backgrounds for your educators? I think Ketra, probably you're sort of touching on this whole idea of the where, in, where does industry and academia meet? 
uh, I think probably Alistair, you've 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 touched on that quite a lot, but that's quite central, I think, isn't it, as to uh, the philosophy behind this, that that whole idea of partnerships and uh, working together. Um, I'm not quite sure if I follow the, the the question. I mean, we we are the Sunderland University is an, an academic uh, you know institution in in the, in the first instance, um, but at you know. The, We've kind of left all our baggage at the door, which I think has been a really, really important thing. And, you know, although we're coming at it with uh, you know, different backgrounds and, and looking at things from different lenses, we're all committed to the, you know, the, the, the final product, which I think is really, really important. And um, so, you know, it's never been, and, and Marcia and, and Sarah possibly contradict me on this, I, you know, and feel free to do so. But I, I, I've, I always felt that we were all pulling in the same direction. There was never something about, oh, I've got, this is what I've got to win with uh, or anything. It was, it was a really, really positive environment as we went through the development phase. But as we went into implementation, it became even more collaborative if that was at all possible. And I, I think, think probably, probably... Take, sorry, Karen, I right. think I'm taking from that as well that finding the right partnership with your training, the employer and the training provider partnership, that's the key to taking a lot mm -hmm. of the, the, the stress points out of, of starting on the apprenticeship journey and taking on an apprentice. There's a lot of learning, I think, for, for industry about education in this. I mean, all of you work in the games industry are, are there because you want to work in games. Um, I think people who've been involved in developing standards have suddenly learned quite a lot about um, the education side of things. I'm sure Jake would agree with that. Um, and uh, all and Sarah and Alistair and Marty, all of you really. Um, just just to jump in here to say, I mean, answer, in answer to that, um, in terms of the assessment that um, Alistair mentioned, um, we are at aim, we are the end point assessment organisation for this. We come in right at the end, but our, but our assessors will be drawn from industry. Um, so mm -hmm. we are looking actually for anyone who's interested in being um, an assessor for this this standard, digital community manager standard. Um, so uh, we will we will help um, and do the training on on how to assess. So um, but I think that, that sort of closes the loop then, doesn't it? Really? So we go back at the end to where we assess. We actually bring industry back in again, and so it is a three sixty degree um, process. Sorry, Marcia, I jumped in the middle of that. That's, that's quite right. right. That's quite right. Oh, it sounds got a bit silly. Um, I think kind of summing up from Alistair as well. So what I'm getting and, and from Sarah, what I'm getting for this process and the apprenticeship is that for the for effort that you put in, you got a you have got a really committed and involved cohort of apprentices who are actually probably valuing their time at Ubisoft uh, more more highly because of the you've shown a huge amount of commitment in themselves you've inspired other team members who sit around them with the mentorship and in and, and kind of enriched their time and also you've opened the door to kind of further or high, more education for the apprentices and for the team members who've got oh actually I can do that whilst I'm in work and they can upskill as well so it's for, for, and that you know we're not pretending that there is no additional effort in developing apprenticeships and, and Jake will be able to tell you that but there is a really good value and there's, there's a pathway for for your employees within that um, I think Jake we were going to talk to you a little bit more about your about the level seven uh, program or apprenticeship or where you're at and what your next steps are what are you looking for from industry now so I suppose anybody who might be interested in working directly with the university to, um, to run their own apprenticeship programme. So if you're interested in sort of using this scheme, as you say, so drawing down on your levy um, to employ uh, level seven game programmers, then, you know, we'd like to talk to you and find out about what your universities you're working with so that we can help to sort of put in the relationships there to get these schemes off the ground. I mean, I think, you know, in the... In the long term, it's not going to be the case that every university is going to offer um, a particular apprenticeship. You have to sort of start those relationships like you have done with Sunderland 
um, that um, you know have a special interest and a special link perhaps with a studio and I think that's a really good place to start so it sounds like an odd thing but even though you know I uh, I work for for Sumo um, I am a leader of the Trailblazer group and I am willing to help people to sort of set up those relationships to try and make the uh, the apprenticeship successful. And that's really important as well. And it comes to something that um, Alistair definitely touched on. It's like the peer to peer learning as well and sharing good practice. So it's not just apprentices potentially in the cohort who can do that. It is definitely also industry. We can learn from each other if we sit down and go, actually, how are you working with your employees? And I know that um, obviously you've just submitted the level seven programmer, but we I am hearing that we are you know, thinking about actually developing further, further uh, apprenticeship standards. Absolutely. I mean, I think there is an appetite to do this and, and there's a lot of sense in doing them fairly quickly because, I mean, as you and I know, the, the rules change periodically. Um, so, you know, the more you can sort of capitalise on your existing knowledge about how the system currently works and, you know, get more apprenticeships through that system, uh, the less effort it will be in the long term. Whereas, you know, if you leave it a few years, you find the uh, the actual system itself has changed a bit and you've got to start from scratch again. Um, so yeah, we're, we're interested in uh, looking at a level seven um, uh, sort of technical artist route. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I need to reply to a lot of emails because I, I get a lot of emails now about um, a level sort of four uh, game programming uh, apprenticeship route as well. And I think there's a lot of interest from people in that. Yeah, I think so. And um, I'm also looking at the potential for um, uh, like a live content producer, live ops technician apprenticeship at level four um, as well, because I've had um, employees come to me and say, actually, this might be quite interesting. It could be small to begin with, but it's a growing area. So I think um, to anyone here who's interested in, in developing apprenticeships, um, whether you're you're an employer or if you're a education provider and you're interested in potentially um, uh, delivering those apprenticeships or training, then please do let Jake or I know or Karen know, and and we will collate that because I think going forward we need to make sure we need to make sure that the games industry is in the centre of the development of really good vocational training for our industry. I think that's really, really valid point, Lars. There are, there are a lot of standards out there. I mean, there are about 600 apprenticeship standards out there. And it might be actually as, a, um, as an employer, you actually want to look at some of the standards that are around other disciplines as well. And, and if, if you are doing lots of mentoring, you might want to look at coaching professional standard or something like that. So you start to bring other standards into, into the games industry. But we've, we found um, in a lot of instances, because an employer wants to spend, spend their levy, as, as Sarah started off with, I think actually we need to find something then. And, and sometimes there's a tendency to try and squash apprentices into standards that don't really quite fit. Um, so there, there, is a, there is a level four software developer out there, but it'd be really great if there was actually a games industry specific um, software developer, which would be actually supporting the games industry and, and the specifics of that. Um, I think that that's good good too and uh, as we said right at the beginning really it's about it's a huge opportunity to raise the profile um, of the industry as a central part of qualifications and training and learning and development and innovation and it's it's such a massive industry so crucial to to um the whole of the country really that it, it's it's an, an enormously good time i think to be part of that and to say actually you know we're just not all about sitting people sitting in there back rooms playing games which actually is a real educational value here um, and promoting that and I think then probably we'll be able to inspire more more uh, careers advisors to actually um, get on board and this is exactly what this this company is about today but the more of those available and the more public profile we have the, the more I think we can actually spread the word and encourage people to become involved makes all that easier too can't say can't say enough times how brilliant they are really but it's really it is really good to hear and as Marcy said that you know three years on since we started this this journey um and we went to the first BGI games at summit and, and stood up and, and uh, spoke to employers to say actually you know degrees are not the only option and people are like, oh 
<laughs> so I think we've come a long way since then. Um, but I think that's that's all so good. Um, just looking in the in the chat box, um, someone's saying, unfortunately, missed the beginning of the panel. Will there be an opportunity to access the recordings after the event? Yes, I think that's absolutely the case. I can see the recording button on now, so it will be recorded. Um, and someone here is saying, I love that these steps are taking place because it means it paves the way for more opportunities. That's uh, Matt, uh, uh, who's in FE. I'm talking about huge interest in design and art. So um, that's possibly the way we, where we're looking at. Um, conclude, concluding thoughts from, from people before we, before we go, it's, we've, we've got a quarter of an hour to uh, chat through some last thoughts. What's been the biggest challenge perhaps? You've talked about successes and I wonder what, 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 what are the challenges that you've had to overcome? Jake, you've got a grin. I know you're going to say something. I mean, it is a challenge working with sort of government procedures um, and government portals. Um, I think they aren't necessarily um, sort of set up to facilitate a sort of fast movement through the process. Let's put it that way. Um, so I think if you do feel that if you could get the right people in the room for a couple of weeks, you could create a standard you know, from scratch, but because of the processes involved and the sort of steps that you have to go through and the sign off that you have to get on each stage, I mean, it does take, well, it's taken us you know, over a year now um, to go from the initial uh, proposal to having submitted the uh, occupational standard and the um, uh, the assessment. Um, so I think be prepared. Yeah, be prepared for a long process, but I, I think it is worth it. And um, I, you know, it, it's evident in the fact that I'm willing to do it again. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> and you wouldn't do it again if you if, you, if it was that awful. <laughs> and we've got some, some great questions come up in the Q and A box actually. Um, Danny Woodward is um, who says that they're taking on two apprentices this month. Not sure, uh, Danny, what those apprenticeships are. Um, and you're asking whether it's three thousand pounds per apprentice. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is per apprentice. Um, oh. Uh, one in IT and one in finance. I think that's the answer. One in IT and one in finance. That's great. Um, Shivani asks, would you happen to know when the next cycle for games apprenticeships would be starting or does it usually happen throughout the year? So uh, do you want to answer this one else here? Sorry. Um, I think because, um, hello Shivani, I think apprenticeships, apprentices are, apprenticeships are linked directly to employers. So it's very much like looking for um, for a job it's a it's an actual role within a studio so it does go throughout the year so the best thing to do is to look at um studios uh, or game developers or publishers that you are that you are interested in um and there is a whole load of apprenticeships just about to start uh, around 2d junior animator and all kinds of stuff as well for the for the VFX and, and um, animation industry. So they're worth having a look at. They do, they recruit as a whole each year, so. Yeah, it does tend to be a, a, a rolling program. And, and we've talked about um, cohorts uh, of apprentices um, and Ubisoft have a, a bunch of them, but it doesn't have to be that. It can just be one, one apprentice at one time. Um, that's something to negotiate with the provider, of course, but um, that's, it's all over, it's all up for grabs, I think really any, um, Someone's here saying nice free money. Is there such a thing as free money? <laughs> um, you do have to pay the apprentices, of course. Um, there are minimum apprentice wages. Um, but uh, yes, it's certainly helpful. And I think anyone, anything we can do to um, take advantage of, what, of what's on offer uh, for the industry, let's take it. And I think Karen's made a really good point is we're all up for doing it again. So, you know, there's yeah. value in the process. So come and join us. I think, um, Rick, are we almost uh, out of our time? We, we almost are, but I, look, I, I don't think people realise how hard you guys have worked in order to make this happen. Um, and I think that 
that really the industry should be very grateful um, for the work that you've all put in. I mean, establishing the first one, submitting the second, and then there's lots of work going into, in, into planning for others. Um, and all I can say is just thank you all for that time and commitment, because although there's some self-interest in there, these are then available to companies right across the country, and they are available to pick up off the shelf and run with, and they've been created really closely in collaboration with, with the, the recipients um, in the sector. So thank you for that. I don't think that's widely um, uh, recognised enough. Thank you for a, a brilliant session, um, and it's just so it's so great to see the progress that's that's being 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 made um, between Games Ed sessions where we talk about the kind of goals and then and then look at everything moving forward. So thank you. Um, we're going to take a break now for uh, ten minutes, um, and then we're going to come back with uh, Jake's leading a session on C plus plus hitting the C plus plus spot, um, which starts at twenty five past four. We'll see you all then. Thanks. <laughs>